uh, recently called away on a trip to Salt Lake City to meet with the donor uh, by Carson Holland, and so he extends his regrets that he's unable to be here. Uh, we're in for a real treat today. Dr. Wasserbach just returned from his sabbatical at the European Laboratory for Parts of Research, or better known as CERN, uh, working on the Super Hadron, or the, the Large Hadron uh, Collider, which is interestingly one of the largest scientific instruments in the world. You'll see some photographs of it, if not the largest. I think so. Probably is the largest scientific instrument in the world, designed to analyze the smallest particles in the world. And, uh, and so we're uh, in to see some of the most fascinating uh, research that's being done today in, uh, in subatomic particle physics. Uh, Dr. Wasserbach received his PhD from Stanford University in 1989 and, and uh, had a double major in mathematics and physics at the University of Utah with his bachelor's degree. Uh, we've been very fortunate to have him in UVU since 2002 as a professor. And he is one of, uh, of quite a number of very prestigious scientists who have been working on, on projects such as this. Uh, he's probably also the most published professor at UVU with over 300 uh, peer-reviewed publications and journals as author and co-author. And uh, so we're very delighted to have Steve here to speak to us. We'd like to present you also with the, uh, the, the poster for cool. the symposium. Thank you. And also with a, uh, one of our college laser pointers that is so powerful that it <laughs> sends a laser beam almost a mile away. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, let's welcome Dr. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm going to tell you what I've been up to for the last year or so and what my new colleagues from Geneva have been up to for the last 20 years or so, preparing this thing so that I could just step right up when it was about to start working and get right down to business. So a quick outline of what I'll be telling you. First, I want everyone to have some idea what particle physics is about and what we know so far in a, a very uh, basic level. And then I'll tell you about the CERN laboratory and the Large Hadron Collider and the experiment that I worked on there, which is called CMS. Our objective in particle physics, I think you could summarize as trying to identify what are the elementary particles of which everything is made, what are, what are the fundamental objects uh, that constitute matter, and how do they interact with each other. The first go at answering this question by Empedocles has the elements as uh, fire, earth, air, and water interacting by love and strife. As the experiments became more advanced, people uh, recognized many different kinds of chemical elements, and Mendeleev in 1869 produced a table which suggested or highlighted the similarities in the properties of different chemical elements, which led to the understanding that, that this large number of different kinds of elements with these interesting patterns uh, had an underlying structure to them, namely that they're just made by uh, assembling different numbers of protons and neutrons and electrons. A similar thing repeated uh, many decades later in the 1900s as scientists, physicists tried uh, smashing particles like protons together, they discovered new particles that didn't exist in everyday matter. And I won't be able to explain what all of these charts mean, but each of the little circles uh, has a symbol next to it, which, was, which is the name of a type of particle that was discovered. And the number of particles in the catalog started to grow again. And patterns, again, were observed among the properties of those particles, which is what these pictures represent, which suggested once again that there was another level of substructure that could simply explain these patterns. And now we understand how that works. We say as of today that the, the standard model of particle physics, uh, our basic framework of understanding at the moment, holds that the 
elementary particles of matter fall into two categories which we have called quarks and leptons and that those quarks and leptons interact with one another by means of different forces called strong, electroweak, and gravitation. And in more detail, here are the elementary particles. The quarks are these six on the purple rectangles and the leptons are these six down here. So in the quarks, we have up, down, charm, strange, top and bottom. And in the leptons, there's the good old electron, but the proton and neutron are not on the chart. They are not elementary particles. They're made out of quarks. They're made of up and down quarks. Joining the electron on the list of elementary particles are the muon and the tau, and three kinds of neutrinos. All of these 12 have antiparticles. Uh, so there's a strange quark and a strange antiquark. And there's an electron and there's an anti-electron which is called a positron. And this uh, anti-particle business, antimatter, is not uh, science fiction and it's not a new thing either. The first antiparticles were seen in 1932, the positron. And uh, it's just a routine thing to produce particles and antiparticles in equal amounts in these collisions. Over here are the particles that are responsible for transmitting the forces between the matter particles. Seems like there was something I was going to say about this. I just, I'll tell you later. Here are some of the questions that we hope to answer with uh, experiments at the Large Hadron Collider. These are the ones that might appear in the news and we have dozens more questions beyond this that I won't be ex able to explain or tell you about here today uh, that are less uh, catchy and less likely to be uh, announced on the news. The first question concerns dark matter. The astronomers uh, tell us by observation that most of the matter in the universe is not the visible kind of stars and nebulas and dust made of protons and neutrons and electrons, but some other unknown material. We would like to understand what that is made of, and it's conceivable that it's made of particles that we don't know about yet, that have never been discovered, and could be created in experiments on Earth. One of the types of particles that could explain this uh, mystery is called supersymmetric particles. There is a hypothesis put forth that every kind of particle that we already know actually has a partner which hasn't been discovered yet, which is probably uh, very heavy. And uh, it could be some of these supersymmetric particles that constitute the dark matter. We hope to find these particles if they exist at the Large Hadron Collider. Another big question that gets a lot of airtime is the origin of mass. The question is, what does mass really mean? At some level, it's easy to understand what mass means. We have objects like uh, large trucks that have more mass, obviously, than little cars. And that's pretty clear. But what about those elementary particles? The top quark has a lot more mass than an electron, yet they both, as far as we can tell, are point particles. We see no internal structure in them whatsoever. They're just dots, yet why does one dot have uh, much more mass than another dot? What does that mean? Well, one possible explanation is that all of space is filled with something called a Higgs field, and the particles sloshing through the Higgs field interact with it, and the strength of the interaction governs how large the mass of the particle will be. This phenomenon that we call mass is really a manifestation of this interaction with the Higgs field. If the Higgs field does exist, then we should find certain particles related to it called Higgs particles. And particle physicists have been looking for Higgs particles for a long time. Still no luck. We hope to find them at the Large Hadron Collider. Matter versus antimatter. As I said, production of matter and antimatter normally happens in equal amounts. And we expect that would have been the case in the early universe also. Yet today, we observe 
lots of matter and very little antimatter. The explanation is probably that there were lots of both and they annihilated with one another, but they didn't quite match up. There was a little extra regular matter left over and that's what we're living in, that's us right now. Uh, and we can understand somewhat why there's a asymmetry between matter and antimatter based on experiments that have been done so far. We see some asymmetries, but so far we don't really see enough of an asymmetry to explain what's going on. We hope in some of the Large Hadron Collider experiments to study this asymmetry more. In all of the experiments at the Large Hadron Collider and many other particle physics experiments, the strategy is like this. You get particles like electrons or protons going really fast and you smash them together. The collision causes a conversion of the energy of motion of the original particles, their kinetic energy, into new mass of new particles that didn't exist before uh, in your experiment. Uh, conversion of kinetic energy into new mass is governed by this famous equation. It tells you how much energy you need to supply to create a particle of mass m. And the reason we want to have the highest possible collision energy is to be able to produce the particles with the highest, pos the highest mass we can and hope to discover particles that previously couldn't be discovered because they're just too massive. When we do all of these experiments, we choose which kind of particles we would like to collide. And we, after we uh, optimize things and within the limits of budgetary constraints, decide how much energy they're going to have. We let them collide, but one thing we can't determine ahead of time is what is going to be produced in the collisions. It's a random process. You just keep smashing together the protons. That's what's colliding in the Large Hadron Collider a proton with a proton and what's going to happen is a matter of probabilities. We know there's a very high probability that the protons will kind of fall apart and there will be a spray of particles in your detector and with a small probability you'll make a W boson and with some other probability you'll make a top quark and an anti-top quark. You just have to keep colliding and collect as many events and save them as possible, analyze them later to look for the thing you want to look for. Now, let's talk about the laboratory. CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, is the original name which continues to be the official name. And that's part of it in the foreground here. The city of Geneva is out in the distance and the Alps back there. We're looking at one end of the main CERN site, which was the part of the site that was first uh, begun development in, 19, in the 1950s. It is the world's largest particle physics laboratory and I've thrown in a few random photos around the lab. You can see it has some modern looking new buildings and uh, oh, it was established near Geneva, Switzerland. And here are some pictures of Geneva, not of CERN at all. And there are 2,400 employees and 90, about 10,000 visiting scientists who spend some of their time or other at CERN while they work at some other laboratory or university. We have a lot of bicycles there and a lot of people at lunchtime in the cafeteria. There's more than one restaurant at CERN and they're open at this main restaurant uh, for breakfast, lunch and dinner seven days a week. And on weekdays at lunchtime, you can hardly move around in there. Half of the world's particle physicists are not there simultaneously, but they visit from time to time, coming from 85 different nationalities and 574 different labs and universities. The site itself, or all of the CERN properties, total about twice as much acreage as UVU's main campus has. 580 buildings with 5.4 million square feet of habitable space, which is more than double what our UVU has. And here you see some examples of buildings from the 50s or 60s that have a bleak industrial look to them. It's a mixture. There's also green spaces and trees. Here's some more views.
the CERN laboratory is run by the 20 European countries that are the members of CERN and they put up most of the money to operate the place although they welcome American and other scientists who come with money from their funding agencies or with pieces of detectors uh, to participate in the experiments also. They also have sheep at CERN. <laughs> they also have the first web servers ever. Tim Berners-Lee used this machine uh, to invent and develop the World Wide Web in 1990. He did that because he wanted to uh, make it easy for the for his colleagues in his experiment to exchange information with one another and right now in our experiment uh, with several thousand people it's uh, it would be impossible really to function without this tool at CERN they have cool things happening like Stephen Hawking shows up to give a talk or on the uh, occasion of the 50th anniversary of the proton synchrotron, which is uh, one of the main, although small, accelerators there, it's still used today to inject particles that are eventually put into the Large Hadron Collider. It's still kept in working order. So for this occasion, they invited a dozen Nobel Prize winners to speak on a, a day and a half little extravaganza. That's the CERN auditorium, which holds a tiny fraction of the people who want to go to events like this. Although they have empty seats here, it's because they reserve them for uh, CERN higher-ups who could just come and go as they please. The rest of us had to go two hours early to get a seat to Stephen Hawking, for example. Okay, the Large Hadron Collider. It's their main project, but not the only project at CERN by any means. There are plenty of other experiments going on. It is the world's largest particle accelerator. Its circumference is nearly 17 miles. And that name, what does that refer to? Large Hadron Collider. It collides particles known as hadrons, which are those that participate in the strong interaction, namely those made of quarks. And in particular, protons are the kind of hadrons that we are colliding right now. There's a plan also to collide lead nuclei in the future in certain periods of time. The planning for the LHC began a long time ago and the project was approved by CERN in 1994. Here's an aerial view of the situation. The main lab that I was showing you photos of is over here. Here's the Geneva airport, and here's downtown Geneva, Lake Geneva. And uh, the experiment that I work on is at the exact opposite end. Where is it? It's over here. Or it's one of these, sorry. It's on the opposite side from the main, but where I'm standing, I can't tell which one that is. Uh, those little circles show places where experiments have been or are now around this 17 mile circumference and this tunnel where the accelerator lives is under the ground underneath the farms and villages and roads mostly in France here's a map of the situation uh, Switzerland is to the right and bottom of this green thing and uh, France is up here and here is that main site for scale this is a little more than one mile long and the proton synchrotron I mentioned before is just situated on that site. This is the super proton synchrotron from the 1970s, which was then considered an enormous accelerator, and now it's just a little injector for the Large Hadron Collider, which is uh, what I'm talking about today. Here is where the CMS experiment is located far away in the middle of nowhere in France. What else should I tell you? I'll go to the next one. If the Large Hadron Collider were in Utah County, this is how big it would be. We're at UVU here, and BYU is over here, and the Provo Airport and Utah Lake. It's about uh, 
several hundred feet underground, depending on which part of the ring you're at, the one in Geneva. Uh, as you get close to the mountains, it's a little farther underground. What is the collider? What does it do? It has these systems. First of all, you're going to have a beam of protons, or two beams going in opposite directions and brought into collisions at certain locations. In order to make the protons turn the corner, you have to bend their paths with magnets and they use 1200 magnets and they have chosen to use superconducting magnets because you couldn't afford to pay the electric bill to use conventional magnets, uh, basically uh, 17 miles worth of the strongest magnets you could afford to make. Superconducting means the wires inside the magnet are kept at very low temperatures so that they, the wires become uh, superconducting, they carry electricity with zero resistance. In fact, liquid helium, superfluid liquid helium is used to keep everything cold. It's at uh, two kelvins, colder than outer space, they say. And so in order to keep that stuff cold, you need the world's largest cryogenic system. You also need to remove as much air as possible from the beam pipes because you don't want the protons colliding with random air molecules flying around in there. So there's a vacuum that is uh, 10 to the minus 13 times the pressure of, of the atmosphere. It's the world's largest ultra high vacuum system. And besides the bend magnets, you also need to keep those protons from uh, dispersing. You need to keep them focused into their little bunches. And then to accelerate the protons, you need another system which consists of cavities into which microwaves are injected. These cavities hold the waves which then present an electric field to the protons as they're going by, which causes them to accelerate. And they go around the ring over and over to get uh, many kicks from the accelerator cavities. So I think that summarizes all the main features that the accelerator has to have to do what it needs to do. Here's a picture of a cross section of the bend magnets. These things are about 40 something feet long, those of which there are 1,232. And the cross section shows these two vacuum pipes down the center with uh, the windings for the superconducting magnet and the liquid helium keeps it cold inside there. And there is vacuum also in this big blue can for thermal insulation. So that's an even bigger vacuum system than the original, although it's not quite the same uh, degree of ultra high vacuum. And this whole can is on the order of this size. And there's basically that same thing going on and on around the ring. You see the big blue cans in place here as far as the eye can see pretty much. Here's a fire extinguisher. It's about the only thing I can tell you to give you the scale of this. All right, we need to talk about the units of energy for these experiments, and I'm going to use one unit of energy throughout, which is called the tera electron volt, or the TeV for short, and it is roughly the energy of motion of a mosquito in flight. The protons in the Large Hadron Collider, at the moment, carry three and a half mosquitoes worth of energy. Each proton has that much energy. And we collide one proton with one proton. So seven mosquitoes is the amount of energy that's unleashed in one of these incredible collisions, which is going to tear apart the space-time continuum. No, <laughs> it's not. It's, it's minuscule amount of energy. The design is to have seven TeV per proton. At the moment, they're not running with seven TeV per proton as a precaution. You may have heard in 2008, when they were getting ready to turn the thing on for the first time, they discovered in a very unpleasant way that some of the connections between the superconducting magnets were faulty. The soldering joints were not well done. And as a result, under certain circumstances, like happened on this uh, very bleak day in 2008, uh, there was a rupture of the beam pipe, there was an opening of the container that holds the 
helium and the helium expanded into the next space and ripped the 42 foot long magnets off of the concrete floor and bent everything and destroyed uh, a lot of magnets and messed up the beam pipe for several kilometers uh, and they had to go with a little brush down three kilometers worth of, or I don't remember how many kilometers worth of beam pipe, double to clean it out. So it was a disaster and they want to avoid that and they've been able to check most of the connections to make sure it's okay but before they uh, are able to completely sign that off they want to play it safe. So we're running at half the design energy which means half of the current flowing in the superconducting bend magnets as will be in the future. Anyway, when a proton has 7 TeV worth of e energy, it's traveling at nearly the speed of light and it goes around that 17 mile circumference 11,000 times a second. And at 3.5 TeV already, it is the world's large highest energy particle accelerator. We collide 3.5 plus 3.5 to make 7 TeV the protons are not just left to whiz around the ring uh, on their own in a kind of continuous way, but they are grouped into bunches because we want to have, first of all, we, we would like to know when a collision is likely to happen. We don't want them happening everywhere around the ring at all times. So by having bunches, we know that a collision can only happen where the bunches pass each other and at the time when the bunches pass each other. Also, that gives you a higher collision rate because you've got all the particles in the same place at the same time, you're more likely to have a collision. We put about a hundred billion protons into each bunch and there are bunches going in both directions. But how many is a hundred billion? I wanted to convey that to you. So I thought about table salt. It turns out that 12 tons of table salt has the same number of salt crystals as 100 billion protons in a bunch. This is just one bunch and we have lots of bunches going in the ring. So far 200 bunches going in each direction has been achieved but the design is for 2800 bunches <coughs> in each direction of about that size. When you have that many bunches, 2808, that's worth this many mosquitoes in flight, total energy, which is equivalent to a 400 ton train moving at 90 miles an hour. So the energy of each proton or each pair of protons is negligible, but if they all were misdirected into a piece of apparatus, it would be like uh, that much energy was crashing into your apparatus and it would be bad. So they are working up to the design conditions gradually to avoid that kind of a mishap. On the first day, we had one bunch in each direction with fewer protons in the bunch. And we've been making tremendous progress. And when I say we, I mean those experts who work on the Large Hadron Collider has nothing to do with me, actually. The large, the LHC experiments, okay, I have something to do with the CMS experiment, but there's a whole separate team of people who are in charge of making the accelerator and uh, collider functions work properly. These are four big collaborations that have, uh, well, some of them have special purposes. ATLAS and CMS experiments, um, these names are attached to big detectors which are situated around the collision points of the Large Hadron Collider protons. And ATLAS and CMS have designed their detectors in a general way to try to identify and measure all the particles that are produced in the collisions, as many as possible, as well as possible. Whereas LHCb <laughs> is interested in uh, particles containing B quarks, and they have quite a different design for their detector. And Alice is interested in those heavy nuclei colliding, and their detector has uh, features that ours don't, and capabilities uh, that are intended for that kind of event, although they also observe proton-proton collisions and do uh, similar measurements to us as well. Okay, next one. CMS experiment. It stands for Compact Muon Solenoid 
and compact here is a relative term. The collaboration has about 3,000 scientists and engineers from 183 universities and laboratories in 38 different countries. And if you go to that remote location in France, you see this complex of buildings standing there, which is uh, on the surface above where the CMS detector sits. So down underground, about 300 feet underground, is this apparatus. Uh, here's a person. This is the compact muon solenoid, which is about 70 feet in length this way and about 50 feet in diameter. And the weight of it in our tons is 16,000 tons. It has more iron than the Eiffel Tower. And it has a series of different sub-detectors who have different purposes and uh, specialties to try to measure and identify all the particles that are produced in the collisions which are at the center. This is a cutaway view, but our detector surrounds the collision point uh, to a very high degree. And there are detectors in here for neutral particles and uh, detectors for charged particles. And there's a superconducting coil which produces a big magnetic field inside to bend the charged particle tracks and we can analyze them for whether they're positive or negatively charged and how much momentum they're carrying. This is the cavern downstairs in 2005 before the installation of the detector. The beam is going to come through the hole behind this plate on the wall and these are about one story high uh, levels for people to walk around. Um, and here is a big shaft leading up to the surface through which the pieces of the detector were lowered. They were assembled on the surface and this is a picture in the surface building showing some of the CMS detector. Now we're seeing a view from downstairs looking up the big shaft and that's the ceiling of the building on the surface and one of these little, uh, I don't know, thousand ton chunks of detector are being lowered with the crane for uh, assembly downstairs. Here's another view when most of the pieces are together uh, showing that, well, it's not yet, here's some people. The beam is going to go through the end hole here and this is uh, where the superconducting coil is approximately and other detectors are jammed inside of that space and these out here are for uh, measuring the energies deposited by particles that have passed through these other parts of the detector. Now I went downstairs for this picture and I looked up one of the other shafts and that's the ceiling of the surface building as well and here you see about 30 flights of stairs going up to the top or there's an elevator provided also if you prefer. Here I am next to the CMS detector This is the view uh, from a webcam of the, from the ceiling of the cavern looking down at the detector while it's all buttoned up and ready for action. And in, indeed, all of these days, uh, they're collecting data. They're putting protons into the machine and accelerating them. Here's a shot in the CMS control room, which is in the, in the surface building above the detector. This is just a small part of the control room. We have all these big consoles and displays showing what's going on and people uh, on duty to keep an eye on every piece of the detector, make sure it's working properly. On the 30th of March of this year, it was a big day because it was scheduled to be the, the day, and it was the day of the first high energy collisions, the first at 3.5 plus 3.5 TeV. And so they had, uh, they had been keeping the media away until this big occasion. And on this occasion, there were dozens of uh, media people from all over the world covering the events. And they put them into the CMS kind of auxiliary control room, which is on the main site of CERN. But it's got a lot more space. And it's a place where still other people sit from CMS and keep an eye on the operation to make sure it's working right. It had a good amount of space to invite 
uh, photographers and reporters to stand at one end and watch us do our thing as we got ready for the first collisions to happen. So the accelerator people put one bunch of protons into each beam pipe and uh, then with their magnet tricks they brought the beams into collision simultaneously at all four of those big experiments and everyone watched on the screen and then suddenly we started seeing collisions and then the celebrating began. This was before the celebrating, this was also before the celebrating, this is showing most of the CMS center as it's called on media day. All the different parts of the detector have a little team of people watching their part and here's one of the very first events in the first minute probably of collisions after those bunches were brought into collision showing the particles that were produced in our detector. The collision happened in the middle and these yellow things are reconstructed tracks of charged particles and the blue and the red are reconstructed energy deposits in the so-called calorimeters that are measuring energies of uh, for example gamma rays that hit the outer parts of the de detector without making a track in the central part. And then we got together for a group photo at the end when all the reporters had left. I am I'm right here. <laughs> That's the spokesman, the leader of the experiment, the elected leader that rotates every couple of years. And this guy, Luca, is one of our top people. He's an excellent person to have on the team and he's on the CNN that day. We have, uh, you know, we have all these people from dozens of different countries and they each save the front page of the newspaper from their countries, uh, showing the, their country's headlines with the same pictures basically, uh, the same people in the picture and I was standing uh, 20 feet away from Luca when that picture was taken. We have, since that day, been collecting data at an ever-increasing rate as they put more bunches and more intense bunches and better focusing of the beams. Uh, we've been able to collect data at a much higher rate. The collision rate is increasing and we have been, even from the first day, uh, preparing uh, measurements and publishing measurements from the, even the first day's worth of data went into a, our first paper from seven TEV collisions. This is a recent one, just from a couple of weeks ago, which is causing a little bit of a stir. Uh, we observed a phenomenon which I can't possibly explain, which was somewhat unexpected, but here's a picture that shows that this thing is happening. It has to do with the correlations between the directions that particles come out from the collision point when uh, two protons collide. And well, basically there's a kind of a ridge running along here which was unexpected. And so we've brought everyone's attention to that and now people are trying to understand what that means. But CMS is very successful in producing the physics results because they have, I think, a tremendous management team. Uh, it's, a, it's almost a business running this collaboration of several thousand people. You can't just let everyone do what they want to do because you'll have some tasks left undone. Instead we have a, an overall boss of the physics analysis with deputies and all of the physics topics are covered by a, a dozen or more different groups which have their own leaders that report to the management and make sure that everything is being measured correctly and that no topic is being overlooked that ought to be measured. It's uh, amazing to watch. I don't know how the physicists learn to be such good managers, but there are people who have learned and are doing this job. And so it's uh, quite a feat to make this 3,000, uh, these 3,000 people work together in a productive way. One thing I've learned also, when I showed up there, I found what these 3,000 people had been doing for the last 20 years. The, the cumul cumulative effect is a very complex experiment. It's amazingly more complicated than the last experiments that I worked on. And uh, it's quite a challenge just for everyone to know what's going on. 
what everyone else is doing. So they have meetings all the time. They're meetings from dawn until dusk, and meetings can be followed by uh, video broadcasts. So I could attend all the meetings from here if I had the time. And uh, there's uh, occasions uh, several times a year called the CMS week when uh, they kind of uh, concentrate the meetings. They have a comprehensive set of meetings in one week and the idea is that maybe people would like to come from their institutes in the US or Turkey or Russia or China or whatever and participate in the meetings in person. So we have an extra high concentration of people and honestly in five or six days they scheduled something like 180 meetings. So you just have to pick the ones that you want to go to, if any, and while you're doing your work on the side. All right, so what did I do when I was there besides taking pictures? I worked on the team that monitored the quality of the data continuously. I'm still affiliated with CMS Experiment. That's the good news. I'm still part of the experiment even though I'm back here and I'm still part of the data quality monitoring team. Uh, I was working as a, first as a person who goes on shift and watches the charts and graphs and makes sure everything is as it should be. If something is wrong, we want to fix the detector now rather than collect five hours worth of bad data and then fix it. So that's an urgent thing to keep an eye on. And then uh, after a while, I was kind of a supervisor of those shift people. And I was also working on improving the instructions so that the people on shift would know exactly what they're supposed to do and uh, work as efficiently as possible. I was also, after a time, added to the CMS Publications Committee, which is the overseeing body for all of the publications from CMS, the scientific papers. And so my job is to read those papers before they come out to make sure that the analysis is done in a valid way but also to make sure they're written in English and have a consistent style from one paper to the next within reason. And I've been put on to one of the particular analyses review committees to oversee in a little more detail one particular measurement out of the dozens that are going on. How's that time going? Very well. I've come to the end. The Large Hadron Collider is large and it collides <laughs> hadrons <laughs> starting in November 2009 at a lower energy and then March 30th 2010 uh, 3.5 plus 3.5 TeV collisions were first recorded. We are producing physics results and as I said the collision rate has been steadily increasing and we can expect a lot bigger increase yet because we only have 200 bunches per beam. It's almost, roughly speaking, for free that you will multiply the collision rate when you put 2,808 bunches in each ring instead of 200, uh, as long as you know what you're doing. And those experts are going to make sure they know what they're doing before they try that. And we will run like this in 2010 and 2011. Then for a year, the thing will be shut off. These uh, colder than outer space magnets will be warmed up to room temperature. Everything will be checked out in detail and fixed up if necessary. And we'll be ready to come back in 2013 for the full design energy 14 TeV. I think that's it. I'd be happy to answer your questions. Bob. You know, colliding those two bunches of 100 billion protons each, uh, how many of them will actually collide? Excellent. Thanks for asking. Right now, probably zero and sometimes one. Oh, actually, we're getting to the point where we have, on average, one collision per crossing. I, I'm still thinking about things as they were six weeks ago when I was there, or eight weeks ago. But now they're getting to the point where roughly one out of the 100 billion of each bunch collide. And when it's all juiced up, there will be nearly 20 collisions per bunch crossing, which is really a mess for us. We would like to 
study one collision at a time and we've got 20 superimposed on each other. But most of those collisions are of a very mundane character where just a little spray of particles go shooting off to the side and it's, it will be basically uh, Im unthinkable that two really exciting collisions would happen in the same bunch crossing. Chris? Is it the only way you're improving the number that hit is by just creating larger bunches? The, the number of protons in the bunches is about at the maximum. The number of bunches in each beam is going to be increased. And another important knob that hasn't been turned yet all the way is the degree of focusing of the bunches. Right now, the bunches are brought into, I don't know the, the distance, but it's on the order of uh, tens of micrometers is the, the cross-sectional dimension of the bunches when they're brought into focus. And that can still be reduced, which would kind of increase the uh, particle density and increase the probability of collisions. I think we have a factor of roughly four of a uh, collision rate we can get by continuing to improve that. Bill. This machine is so incredibly large that it, and has very strong high mechanical stresses in it. It's being driven with something like a 12 kilohertz signal. Does anybody feel that? Is there any kind of vibration or something? That, that no, I don't. I, I haven't heard of anything that. like that. No. Okay. Fern. Uh, I know that the whole purpose is to understand like the nature of the universe, but is there some real world application that's going to come and affect all of our lives, like in the next 10, 20 years? Or there will be. Okay. While we're developing these experiments, the technology is being pushed, and so things like the World Wide Web, uh, vacuum technology semiconductor technology. In the CMS detector, the inner part of the detector is intended to, to measure charged particles. And over the past uh, couple of decades, the technology for doing that has been developed, uh, which includes uh, silicon wafers with uh, patterns etched on them in the form of strips or CCD devices, which are used in uh, video cameras. So we use those things and we push the technology to the limit. We have a tennis court's worth of area of silicon wafers in that central detector of the CMS experiment. So that, that's one kind of idea. The vacuum, the cryogenics, all of those things, I would say, are the most likely to have a, a short time scale impact on things. And then the, the physics is uh, 100 years from now, maybe it'll have an impact. So you're detecting medium we have several kinds. There's uh, the silicon wafer solid state uh, for the charged particles in the inner part of the detector. There's uh, crystal calorimetry. So there are uh, lead tungstate crystals surrounding the tracker, uh, which would record, uh, which produce a flash of light when a gamma ray hits. And the intensity of the light is measured with a photo detector. Um, then there's lots of, on the outside, where the particle density is lower, there are kind of drift tube technologies with uh, uh, tubes that contain a specially chosen gas and a little wire down the center uh, at high voltage. And when charged particles cross through that, it ionizes the gas and those, uh, that little avalanche is detected uh, electronically. So it's a combination of many technologies. Please. All right. The standard model is, uh, it has a Higgs boson in it. They've kind of penciled that in as the explanation of mass in the standard model. However, I think most th uh, particle theorists don't expect to find a Higgs that looks like the standard model version. And they have fancier models like supersymmetry and more, many more models that would have a different scenario of Higgses uh, some models have uh, multiple Higgses. And so we would, if we find something that looks like a Higgs particle, our first job would be to understand which kind of Higgs it is, if any that has been uh, hypothesized. 
if we find supersymmetric Higgs particles and the supersymmetry theory is confirmed, um, my understanding is that has uh, strong implications for uh, the, the grand unified theory that you're talking about where the strong force and the electroweak force um, are combined together into, uh, they're interpreted as different manifestations of one uh, general kind of force. So right now, without supersymmetry, it looks puzzling how that's going to happen and people point to the benefits uh, toward unification of supersymmetry as kind of a circumstantial evidence that it exists. Some people, theorists, think it's guaranteed that it exists. But uh, as an experimentalist, I have to see it first before I sign on to that. Please. As, as you said, the, the bunches are going to increase in number and, and thus the, the collisions will increase. Um, now, as that debris field increases with the collisions, is that going to ruin the integrity of the data at all? Is there any chance that it will recombine since there's so much debris? Or? No, the, the, the complication is what I was just alluding to. To have 20 collisions in one bunch crossing is called pileup. It just uh, confuses the analysis of the event. But the particles, well, I, I won't say that those particles just uh, disappear harmlessly, but the whole room is filled with radiation down there. Uh, you'll just have more radiation, and no one will be down there. No one is down there now when it's running. Uh, so um, it really doesn't have a drastic effect on the hardware other than to shorten the lifetime of the devices. Certainly those things that are right near the center are not going to last forever under those conditions. There's uh, hundreds of millions of particles per square centimeter expected to come through per second through those uh, inner parts of the detector. I know, I know many of you probably need to go to class right now. We'll take a few minutes to let you go. Let's give Dr. Wasser back. Thank you. Well, can they know something, or is there some kind of destructive, you know, destructive implications? It was a good.